what we're going to talk about today. And see, when, when people get first started in the business, obviously there's an excitement level. They get started, they're excited, they're motivated, and they start going and applying information. Now, there's two ways to go about learning the information and applying it. Okay, and I'm going to tell you what I typically do when I get into a something new that I don't know about. Okay, and I want to learn about it, but also I want to get results quickly. Um, you know, like when I first initially started bidding on HUD homes, um, there is a way and a process to go out and learn something and then apply it. So, you know, what a lot of people do is they want to learn everything. They want to get all their ducks in a row. They want to get, they want to learn as everything possible. I got to learn everything first. I've got to go through all the videos. I got to learn all the information. I got to read all the books. I got to listen to all the podcasts before they actually take the first step, which is action. Now, education and knowledge without action is completely irrelevant, right? So what has to happen, and I know there's different personality types. There's personality types that that um, that want to and have to know every analytical detail and specific about exactly the how it works, and they read every sentence and every word, and which is good. And that's more of an analytical type person, an engineer type, you know, which I am definitely not. I'm blow and go. So so and there's there's two sides that I wish I was more like that. Um, Randy Doherty, who is uh, um, a uh, he's one of the Barons members and coaches, he is very analytical and specific. He's awesome. I love him because he has everything all detailed and organized. Whereas I'm just like boom, let's just let's just get it done. So there is a balance between the two. But when it comes to learning and applying and and, and getting results quickly, um, it, it it starts with learning as you go. Okay, so. Um, so you know, when it comes to like say you know the Flip to Freedom Academy and wholesaling, you can learn something and then apply it, and then what will happen is it will uh, it will lead you into something where you're going to ask a question. So let's say for an example, it says okay, I want you, you got to go send postcards to absentee owners. Okay, so first off, okay, where do I get the postcard? Okay, it's great. Where, who do I have the postcards, you know, who send it out? So those are all different steps. Then the question becomes, what is the list I send it to? So then you can go in the academy. We show you how to pull a list off list source so you can get it from, you know, from, um, from a U.S. leads list, from uh, an inheritance list. So then you go, okay, okay, now, now I, you know, where do I send the calls to? I send them to a, a Google Voice number or send them my cell phone or send them to Pat Live system or send them to, you know, a regular voicemail system like Freedom Voice, whatever. We can kind of give you different options in there. Um, and then you go, okay, now when the calls come in, what do I say and what do I do? Well, okay, now you can go in and learn the script. So it's not like you have to know everything all at once. You can take simple steps then you can go back into the academy and get the question answered and then go follow another step. For an example, like when I, uh, when I learned how to bid on HUD homes, you know, I, if you remember, I, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard the story, but I, I heard an interview. Um, I, can't, I don't even know who the gentleman was. I tripped across it online, and there was a guy. He was talking about how he wholesaled HUD homes. It was literally about a two-minute clip where he said he went on a site, HUD home store, he would bid on a house, and he would get under contract and flip it, and, and the, the, the person interviewing was like, oh, that's killer, you know, great, great information, cool, you know, now, and moved on to something else, on the, like, doing things off the MLS. So I heard that, I was like, holy cow, that's incredible, and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. But I didn't know a thing about flipping HUD homes. I didn't know how the website, I didn't know how to do the bids, I didn't know how to do anything, right? I didn't even know the process of doing it. So what I do is I went out and I went to HUD Home Store. I read the information. I figured out how to place the bids, right? I found out that my wife hung her license with an NEID registered broker, so we got the NEID registered number, right? Then the question was because it goes, how do you place a bid? So when I looked and you know, I just went through the process and I did everything wrong, right? I, I, I did it you know, wrong and I, I was just learning and understanding until I figured out a system to make it work successfully. But I just step-by-step -step process instead of trying to learn everything because there's really nothing out there on strategically on how to 
bid on HUD homes. So I had to pretty much create it myself, right? So I looked at different you know, tidbits and I, I, I tested and practiced and tested and practiced and tested, you know, until I found a, you know, a way that I got the winning bid and I realized what the winning bids are and then how to go during the process. But my first initial thing was get an acceptance. I didn't care about how the escrow was going to work. I didn't care about how to fill out the paperwork. I didn't care about how the heck I was going to sell the thing. I didn't care about proof of funds. I didn't care about any of that stuff. All I wanted to know initially was how do I get an accepted bid? So I bid, I bid, I bid, I bid, I bid like crazy until I got an accepted bid. As soon as I got an accepted bid, holy cow, I need to fill out the paperwork. I don't know how to fill out the paperwork. So I learned, I figured out, I, you know, I remember the first contract I went through, I was even nervous. I remember I was like, I've, I've done, you know, a ton of deals in real estate, but I was nervous filling out this contract because I've never done it before. It was different. It was new. So then, um, then I got the contract. I sent it in, right, with the earnest money. I, you know, got all the information down, sent it in. And then, um, then I was like, okay, now what? Okay, well. There's, you have to open escrow, you know, with, they're going to open escrow with these three different title companies. So I was like, you know, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to talk to them. So I went down there, I brought them donuts and I went down and I talked to each one of the uh, three companies. They're all Grand Canyon title here in Phoenix. And I went down and talked to all the HUD closing agents. And I sat down with them and talked to them about the process and how it works and double escrows and assignments and what you can't do and what you can do and, you know, how can it, how does it work? And so I went and met them all. Right, because I never done it. I've never done it before. So then I went out and I talked to my escrow officer and how we could do it. So we could do an actual double escrow simultaneous close. And I went through that process. And then, um, and then you know, then I went out. Well, how do you sell it? So I went out and put it on my site. I had a buyer that came in and went through the process and I closed my first transaction. So it went through the whole entire process. I closed the first deal and I think I made three thousand dollars on my first deal. Then it was over because now I did it once. Now it's rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And from that point forward, I don't know, I've done 150 home flips, you know, in the past 18 months. You know, it's just been absolutely crazy. It's been a, uh, it's been a great deal source and a, a great revenue source. I learned how to increase profits. I learned how to get bids at a better price. Um, I actually got a reputation now with, uh, with the asset manager where, where I, I have a little edge on bidding, which works. I learned strategic ways to bid. You know, and all, this, all this is in the Flip to Freedom Academy, but I guess what I'm trying to say is this. And when it, when it comes to application and it comes to applying something and it comes to becoming successful in anything that you don't know, there's a process of learning and applying, learning and applying. And what happens is you'll apply, which will bring you to a next step, which then will ask the question, what do I do to fill out the contract? Then you can go back in the academy, you can learn how to fill out the contract, and then you can go proceed forward. Well, what do I say to a title company? You can go back to the academy and learn it. So there's a process, and what, will, what it will do is it will get you a fast start moving forward. And what's great about it is then you can go in the Flip to Freedom Academy group, right? And you can ask questions there, and everybody will participate and answer, you know, answer, answer questions and stuff, or get on these coaching calls we do every two weeks to have a support system uh, to help you through the process. Now, let's say you've done that. Let's say you're going through the process, you're doing it, and you're working, and you've been in for, for a month or two or three months, and you've done, your, you've done the mailing, and you've talked to people, you've talked to sellers, you're starting to do, go through the process, but now it's not working, or it's not working at all. Or maybe you've done a deal, but then you can't get another deal, right? Or and you're, then you're getting kind of nervous if you're like, well, was I a one-trick wonder? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's it. I got, I got one deal. Now I can't get another deal for life dependent on it. That's what happened to me. When I first started, I got my first deal. In three weeks, I made $11,008. And the next deal was this nasty, beat-up house, and I did everything wrong. I gave the seller earnest money gave him instead of giving it to a title company. He made me waive all my out clauses, which was completely stupid, right? That means if I wouldn't have found a buyer on my second deal, I would have had to close or find a way to buy the house. I didn't understand the ramifications of that. So I was like, I just wanted to get the deal. So I waived all the contingencies and everything. And uh, luckily, and I didn't have a buyer's list, right? You know, I, I had a title company that was good, but I didn't. I I, 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 I had no. I was completely naive. But then what happened was, is I found a buyer and I made two thousand dollars on the deal. And 
I was excited. Yeah. But then after that point, I couldn't get a deal with my life. I mean, it was like, like three or four months after that, I could not get a deal if my life depended on it. I was working hard. I was getting leads. I was talking to sellers. I thought I was doing everything right. I couldn't get a deal and it wasn't working. So what we're going to talk about today is what happens or what can you do, right, when it's not working. So what to do when it's not working. You've done everything you could. You've worked hard. You're, pu you're pumping out leads, right? So during that time frame of when I went and got my first deal, then I went and got my second deal, and then there was that you know, two or three month gap in between, I got my third deal, you know, that gap, it was scary. It wasn't working. I was pushing. I was working hard. I was doing everything I could do to make it happen. And I thought I was doing everything right, right? Um, but it still wasn't working. I was starting to panic, right? Because at that time, I quit my job after my second deal, which, you know, that's why I always tell people, I say now, I said, get one year's worth of income in the bank as fast as possible, and then you'll have the option to quit your job. Okay, I quit too soon, and now I went into panic mode because now I had to generate revenue, right? But I wasn't getting deals, and that's not a way to approach a seller when you're in a needy situation, right? Just like a dog can smell fear, well, sellers can smell if you're broke and you're needy and you need the deal. When I go in and talk to the seller, I don't need the deal. I, you know, I walk in and it's like, great, if you want to go, great. If you don't, and then I can use fear of loss effectively. Fear of loss, right, when you're negotiating with motivated sellers, and if you want to understand fear of loss, go to the last, uh, the last coaching call we did, the 522 coaching call. That coaching call talks in detail about um, advanced negotiation techniques. But we talk about fear of loss. Now, fear of loss is a, only a technique that can be used if – you're not portraying a need that you got to get the deal. Um, and that, that, is, that is something a seller can smell. So we're going to talk about what to do when it's not working and how to solve that problem. Why it's not working. Okay, here's the first reason. Insufficient and consistent marketing. Okay, there's insufficient and consistent marketing. There's lack of deal recognition. That means leads come in, you're talking to sellers, but you're not able to recognize um, if a deal's a deal, if the seller's motivated or not. That's a, almost like you're digging for gold, but you don't know what gold looks like. So you pick up a rock and you go, is this gold? You pick up a, another rock and you go, is this gold? Then you pick up this and is this gold? Then you pick up a handful of dirt and go, is this gold? So what happens is you, maybe you're moving a lot of dirt, maybe and stuff, but you don't know what a, a deal looks like. You don't know what you know a, a piece of gold looks like. And then the third thing is you, your behavior and your thoughts. Okay, that this is this is why it would not be working. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix and show you how to fix each one of these three um, in this call. So by the end, you'll know exactly if you're in a stuck position right now, what you can do to get unstuck, okay? Because it's important, you know, um, or maybe you're not doing enough. Maybe you're, maybe you, you know, you're, you're only doing one deal a month or one deal every other month, right? But you want to do more deals and you want to be able to quit your job. Well, this will help you kind of get unstuck and get to that next level. So now, insufficient and consistent marketing. Now, when it comes to insufficient, right, insufficient is we're not doing enough. So what we got to do is track the amount of leads per day that we're getting, the amount of leads per week that we're getting, and the amount of leads per month that we're getting, okay? Whatever you track and measure will grow. So if you're just going through your business and you're doing it as a hobby, you're just going and you're going and you're going, right? And, 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 and if, I, if I was to ask you how many leads that did you get last 
you know, yesterday? How many leads did you get last week and how many leads did you get last month? If you don't know, if you can't answer that question, well, then you're treating the business like a hobby. So you should know specifically how many leads you get per day, per week, and per month. And that is something you can track. You can keep a, a simple spreadsheet. You, we have an actual form inside the Flip to Freedom Academy that you can use, and you can track how many leads you get on a per day, per week, or per month basis. Okay, it's under the um, it's under the I don't know spreadsheets and documents tab inside there. So why is this important? This will be important because there'll be a realization on your side of exactly what is happening in your business. So if someone comes to me and they say, this, is, this doesn't work, I'm gonna say, okay, it doesn't work. It's gonna be three different things. It can be inconsistent marketing, lack of deal recognition, or it's them. That's it. That's the only reason why it wouldn't work. So I first thing I'd say is say, great, how many leads did you get yesterday? Well, I didn't get any. Well, okay, then how many leads did you get last week? Oh, I got one. Well, how many leads did you get last week, last last month? Oh, most of the time it's I don't know, or it's twelve, <laughs> or thirteen. It's a minimal number, okay? It's a minimal number. So what I focus on in my business when it comes to this, it's lead generation. Now you know in the first uh, I think couple. Um, uh, videos inside the academy there I talk about specifically um, with a mind map of the lead channels generating leads now initially at first you know if you're first getting started you know your main lead sources are going to come from Google AdWords and direct mail campaigns those are going to be your main lead sources and then you know let's say uh, bandit signs so those are the top three that you can initially start generating leads immediately now, how could you do free ways to get leads? Well, you could post ads on Craigslist. That's for free. You can call for sale by owners. You know, what do you say to for sale by owners? I saw someone ask a question that. Well, when you call up for sale by owners, they say, hey, I see you got your property for sale. I'm a cash buyer, and I represent a group of cash buyers. We're looking for specific deals in your neighborhood. Okay. What's the minimum cash number you could take if you didn't have to pay any real estate commissions, any fees? What is the lowest you could possibly take if I was going to offer cash today? That's it. They have it for sale. So you say, okay, they, they come back and they say a lower number, right? They have it listed for 100 and they come back, well, I could probably take 92. Well, let's say you say the comps are at 110. Okay, well, you got a little spread there, but you got to make a bigger one. So you say, okay, well, why don't I come look at the house and check it out? So maybe you can go look at the house then and go check it out, and you can bring lower comps, maybe comps in the 70s, 75, 80 maybe. So you bring comps over to the house, you sit down, you make friends with them, you talk to them, you build a report just like I talk about in the academy, and then you go and you say, hey, listen, here's the supporting comps. Here's what's selling for the same condition property. You know, so I can't do 92, but could you do 82? What you know, could you do whatever? And that is opening up a, a, a spread. So with the for sale by owners, that's all you want to do. You want to start, and you want to talk, and you want to work with them um, to be able to get that deal done. So back to this: insufficient leads. Keep a log for 90 days on lead flow. So make a commitment today that if you really want to. Uh, understand your business and the lifeblood of your business, keep a log for 90 days of how many leads you get per day, how many leads you get per week, and how many leads you get per month. Okay? Now, if you want to increase your income, right? If you want to increase your income, right, then you increase your lead flow. So the goals become right marketing goal and a lead goal so you say okay this month i want to generate 250 leads so then you can go back and set a marketing goal of how much marketing you want to do or how many people you're going to talk to you have a number to shoot for so what if you have a limited marketing budget then you can send as many postcards or, or yell letters as you can 
um, you know, get your Google AdWords campaign, spend as much as you can spend on getting leads coming in. And then for the rest of them, talk to, you know, put ads on Craigslist or whatever. And then, you know, um, put ads in the cheap little ads in the penny saver newspaper. Those will get leads coming in. If the focus becomes lead generation, consistent lead generation, and you have sufficient leads coming in, your business will grow. I can tell you that my main focus in my real estate business is increasing the amount of quality leads that come in. Now, what happens is there's a bottleneck in my business right now, and the bottleneck is Stan, right? Because Stan can only handle a certain amount of leads. So we're in the process now of looking for another person that can come in and handle leads. Because if I drop 300,000 letters and we get you know, a thousand calls, he can't handle that amount of leads that come in. So that becomes a bottleneck. So now we have to hire another rock star to come in to be able to manage those leads and be able to help do deals. Okay. Now, initially when you're first starting, it's just going to be you, you, and you that's going to be handling the leads. But understanding that as the business grows, the number one focus becomes a lead goal and a marketing goal. Because if you know that the leads increase your income, the more leads you get, the more income you can make. It's a direct relation. A direct relation. So if it's not working, right, you first look at the amount of leads you get coming in, right? And then if we can change and we can tweak that, if we can change your focus to say, I'm going to set a goal and I'm going to get 250 leads this month. And that's your goal. Then you work toward a goal and take it seriously and push yourself to work toward that goal. What will happen is is that the and then you watch it. Then maybe you maybe you maybe you you you, you blow it and you only get 180 leads that that month. Say, listen, okay, now I need I'm going to push it. Now I'm going to hit 250 this month. Then the next month you push it to go hit 250 leads. Watch your business grow. So people say, how do you double your business in this business? If I want to double my business, which is my goal is to 10x my business, I get a 10 times the amount of leads coming in. So if I'm a, you know, initially sending 50,000 letters, I got to send out 500,000 letters. I got to 10 times my business. But now I got to say, okay, for us to handle those leads, holy cow. I'm going to take on more people to do it. Or then I'm going to have to expand into other markets like we did recently. Number two, lack of deal recognition. Now, this is more when you're newer and you're getting started and, you're, and you kind of don't really understand a deal, what a deal is. Not knowing how to recognize a deal or motivation. Now, there's two ways to overcome this, okay? Number one, right, is is when it comes to motivation. Initially, uh, when we when I when I, you know, I determine motivation different from other people, um, different from you, different from you. If we were going to sit down and talk to the exact same seller, I would ask different questions. You would ask different questions, and then we would have a different. Um, understanding of what the motivation level is of the person we talk to. So that is a variable depending on the person. So how do we eliminate that variable from our business? What we do to eliminate that variable from our business when it comes to the motivation factor is you make an offer on every single lead that comes in. So if you generate, in our example, 180 leads for the month, every single one of those 180 leads Right now, some people are going to be opted out, opt out. Just you know, Doug, take me off your list. So that's maybe 30 leads to say, take me off your list, right? But the balance of the leads, every single one of those leads, should get a contract. Should get a written contract from you. Because that will eliminate motiv you know, determining motivation. Because if I think they're motivated and you don't think they're motivated but you send a contract, that will pull out the motivation. So I remember when I first started, you know, Stan, I was like, okay, you know, how do you determine motivation? So, and it became, it was you know, kind of 
it, it, it was it was it was it was this variable that I couldn't nail down. So I said, you know, forget it. Just make an offer on every single property at seventy percent, at sixty percent. Make an offer on every property at sixty percent. Some will take, some won't. So we just started making offers, and it's amazing how the amount of contracts that came in. Okay, now when it comes to not recognizing a deal, when it when it comes to not recognizing a deal. <clears throat> is that let's say a deal or a lead comes in and you don't know if it's a deal or not. I'll keep going here. Okay. Not recognizing a deal. And if they're motivated, so let's say let's say you can determine if there's motivation or not and you just want to put an offer. If a lead has no equity or high equity, any type of equity, and there's a motivation, key point, if there is motivation, right? If there's motivation, then if they have zero to a bunch of equity, you can make a deal out of that deal, okay? You can make a deal out of it. So let's give you a theoretical example. Let's say you have a property that's free and clear. What do you do? That's considered a high equity deal. So, and if there's motivation there, you can go at 70% less repairs. Now, I'm going to tell you something real quick. Is the market has shifted. We're going into a rising market. So, you can be tighter on numbers and you can still generate a profit. So, instead of offering 70% less repairs, you might just offer 70%. <laughs> you might just offer 65% of, after, you know, after repair value. And then turn around and sell it for 75% because now the margins are tightening because we're going into a rising market. Now what's great about it now is that we're still getting deals at 70% less repairs or lower, but now instead of selling them you know, at 70% less repairs, less our, our, uh, our offer price, our profit, now we're, we're still getting deals that way, but then we're able to sell them at 75 to 78 percent so we're increasing our margins dramatically that way but will we walk from a deal if it doesn't if if, if, if we do up uh, 70 percent less repairs less profit well if i can't get it for that i'm going to walk if you understand what you can sell the property for and it's a simple way to do that is get on all the other wholesalers list and see what they're selling their properties for of arv You'll notice that as we go into a rising market, what they sell the property for percent of ARV will increase. Meaning, in a bad market, they're selling at 65%, 66%. In a hot and rising market, now it goes to 70%, then it goes to 73%, then it goes to 75%, then it goes to 78%. That means 78% for LTV. So if you go and negotiate with a seller, and if you know that information, you can get the property under contract at 70% and still make an 8% margin on the deal. Where normal, most other wholesalers would walk away from the deal because it's not 70% less repairs, less my profit. Okay? Understanding your numbers of where it is in the marketplace, what the competition is selling stuff for, get the deal under contract. Because here's the thing. Even if you're a little nervous on your price, you tell the seller that. So if I'm negotiating with a seller and they say, listen, for an example, we just recently got a property under contract. I wanted to be at, say, 95. The seller said, absolutely not. I want 106. 106 or get out of my house is what he told Stan. I said we need to be at 95. So I call, Stan called me and said, what should I do? I said, get the contract because we have an out clause. Right? What what do we have to lose? Right? We're not going to lose our earnest money. Right? Ten bucks. <laughs> so, what do we have to lose? So I said, get the contract. So we got the contract. We turn around, and put it out for, I don't know, it was like one sixteen or something like that. Okay, boom. Turn around. You get the contract. You get the deal. Make ten thousand dollars on the deal. Right? Or we could come down off that. If we make two or three thousand dollars, it's still. A deal, you know, it was it was a deal. We made some profit on it. If we can't get it sold, right, quickly, 
then we can back out of the deal and say, hey, you know what? I told you, know, I tell the seller, I say, listen, I said, you know, make sure you tell the seller you're nervous. Say, listen, I'm really, I'm nervous at this number. I like the house. I like the location. You know, I, I really want to be at 95, but, you know, um, between me and myself, for me, it's a little tight, but for my investment group, I think we can make this number work and then get the contract signed because that will give you the opportunity to be able to sell the property and you'll never know who's on the other side. You may have a cash buyer that wants to be a retail buyer that's going to scoop it up if you put it on Craigslist. You may have a, an investor that wants to um, an investor that wants to um, to like uh, for a buy and hold. It might be a hedge fund coming in that wants to purchase the property and see the value there. You never know. So even if you're nervous, it's a higher price where you typically walk from because we are in a rising market. Get the contract. Okay, get the contract. And put it out there because right now there's 4.7 months of inventory in the marketplace nationally on a normal market six months right so the inventory levels are tightening right now in a tightening inventory market whoever can control the property will make the most amount of money so the bottom line is if you have an opportunity meet with a seller and the numbers just don't work and they're a little tight don't walk away from it. Get a contract because it always can have the ability to try to make it work. You might not make as much as you normally make, you know, on a five to ten thousand dollar deal or twenty thousand dollar deal, but it gives you the opportunity. Okay. So now, that's a deal with high equity. What if you have a deal with no equity, minimal equity? Well, guess what? What's great about it now is you can, you, you, I mean, well, man, just like a teaching the academy is you can do an agreement for sale and contract for contract for deed. Even if a house owes 90000 98000 and it's worth $100,000, there's 2000 in equity, can you make a profit off that deal? I can make ten grand off that deal if there's a motivation level from the seller. And I would structure it where I keep the existing loan in place for the term of five years. We give the seller 500 bucks, right? Right? And, and purchase a property on agreement for sale and then assign out that agreement for sale for ten grand. Twelve thousand dollars down, three thousand dollars I mean uh, you know, um, you know, eleven thousand dollars down. A thousand goes to closing cost, five hundred goes to the seller, and then ninety five hundred goes to me. Okay, that's a <clears throat> that's a ten thousand dollar deal. Because in this marketplace there are tons of people with cash, but there's also a lot of people that can't qualify for a loan. So if you give them the opportunity to purchase a property, no banks, no problem, with $11,000 down, your phone will flood with buyers. So any type of deal that comes in, little to no equity, we're, gonna, we're going to target it. Okay, we're going to target it. So now what happens is someone asked me, um, I think it was Ty, asked me, he said, um, how do you target those specifics? Well, in leads, in, uh, in, um, in list source, Right, go back and watch the list source video, in the list source or watch last week's video. We I kind of took you through, and you know, or watch the five key formula, any one of those, and I take you through list source and how to use it instead of in list source going back to say 2003 deed dates where they have 10 years of pay, go back to 2005, go back to 2006, right, where you know where they have maybe three or four years of payment history on on the loan. Okay. Now you're going to get houses. You don't want houses upside down like short sales. You want houses that have little to no equity. Okay. And maybe you maybe you put in a filter in there that has you know 80% equity in it, or I mean 80% or 20 you know 10% equity in the property, um, or 20% uh, equity in the property. So what happens is now you can have uh, those deals that come in and you can structure them um, where you can do uh, seller financing on them. Now, when it comes to comping a property in today's market, I want to take you into uh, Redfin real quick. Uh, hold on. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, when it comes to comping a property, I wonder where, let me see if I can find. It's 
pulling up our whiteboard here. So we get it. We're gonna send. Five eight zero seven West P P I E R S Pearson. Let me see if I can find this one. Fifty ninth and Camelback, fifteen hundred square feet. Okay, this is a property we got in our contract, I think it was last week, Friday, um, for 50 grand. So, I, and I'm using Redfin here, and you can use Zillow, you can use the MLS, but I want to show you a couple things you can do. If you don't have... Um, if you don't have Redfin in your area, that's fine. Eventually, they'll, they'll be in every market. Um, but like I said, you can use Zillow or have your realtor pull comps. So I'm going to show you what you're looking for. That's the most important thing. Now, in inside of Redfin here, I, I eliminate. If it's a single-family house, I eliminate all this stuff. I'm going to put MLS listed homes, right? And I'm going to include active and under contract and pending. And I'm going to go update. Okay, so if you see here, pending, 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 pending. Now I'm going to zoom out. I'm trying to get an idea of what's going on here. Now look at pending, 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 pending. The next available house is 1900. Here's one for 1600, which is considered a comp because ours is 1522. So we got under contract for 50. The next closest house available, nine days on markets, 127. Let's see what it looks like. It's actually not a bad house. Let's see if it's renovated. Truly hidden gem, great property process, surprise features, new roof, air conditioning, unit insulation, synthetic stucco, double pane windows throughout, installed in 2010, good size lot. So it doesn't say it's been fully renovated. Let's, you know, this looks pretty nice. This has been fully renovated for this area. So this is a, this is actually a really nice. House. So this this would be retail. So we're in it for fifty, a retail retail price. Now, because we're in a rising market, buyers now are comping properties off pendings versus solds because they know the pending property becomes a trend by the time they buy it renovate it, fix it, sell it, it's going to close. So they're coming in and they're purchasing properties off pendings. So here's, look at, exact same house, 1522. This is the exact same house as ours. 55 days, 3, 3, 1522, 109.9. Nine. Let's see if it's renovated. No, 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 no. Uh, not renovated. See, it has regular, you know, regular tile, has Formica countertops. It's just, it's clean. It's not renovated. So I would, I would consider it's not renovated, just, just, just clean. So 109 or higher. 1522 to 127, which is potentially pending. So I'd probably comp our property, if, if it's fully rented, probably about 115. 118 or so. Let me see that one for 127. They're sitting at about 75 bucks a foot. Yeah, so it puts right, all right, 115 as a retail number. So times 70% is $80,000. <clears> so at a wholesale number. So I'm, and now I'm going to look at, you know, $80,000 is a wholesale where this, this house would fly off the shelf. They've got here, these are more probably short sales. There's really nothing available. 89, 50, 109 is the closest one. So yeah, so I mean, really nothing available. So I mean, in it for 50, sell for 80, we're talking, that's a $30,000 deal on a, on a little tiny house. I mean, we could probably even sell it for more. And I'm just saying what 70% is. 
right? If you take 115, you know, and this house needs some work, so I'd probably sell it at 70%. But, you know, if it was a little bit cleaner, I mean, we could push the thing to 75, 78%, sell it for like 86 grand and turn it, and turn it into a $36,000 deal. So this one hasn't even hit our, hit our site yet, or actually, we're not posting properties on the site anymore. We're just blasting out emails because they're moving so quick. Um, but, but here's my point when it comes to comping properties. Um, in a rising market where you have a lot of pendings, a lot of activity going on, you want to price properties and look at properties that are pending. Now let's go to solds. Now solds here, what's the highest sold? Here's one for 110, 1800 square feet, 16,132. That's pretty close. 1522, exact same house right here, sold. 1522, 75 bucks a foot, 32105. Okay, so so now let's see if it's renovated. You can get the same data off your off your MLS. Uh, no, let's see if it's renovated. No, this is not looking brown carpet. No, no, this is not renovated. So this sold for 105, and it's not renovated at 70 bucks a foot. So that's not that's what you're, you're looking. I mean, that's and that's exact same house. <clears throat> and then you got these higher comps up here. So I, I would even push that and say, you know, it could potentially be 120 or more just because that comp right there, just because that's unrenovated, sold at 109. Okay. So what you're doing is you're looking for the absolute highest solds and the highest pending properties you can, right, that are within, within 200 square feet of subject property that are either pending or currently active, and you can price off those things. Because now in a rising market and reduced inventory, people are pricing based upon um, um, priced upon the the pendings and the highest sold comps that are that are going on in the area. So why I'm telling you this is I don't want you to leave a lot of money on the table um, to a certain you know certain aspect. Obviously, you want to sell it and you want to sell it quickly, but you have the ability to push the numbers up based upon the pending and based upon the sold. If that makes sense, so see so that that's how you want to comp a property. Now the other thing is this: is that is that get the deal, be tenacious. There's two ways, and we talked a little bit about this in the last two weeks, uh, two weeks ago. Is that there's two ways to approach a deal. When you obviously you're going to make offers on every single property no matter what. Every single lead that comes in, you're going to make an offer no matter what. Make that a part of your business no matter what, and your business will change. Okay? De motivation or no motivation, make an offer. Um, now when you actually you determine there's motivation, you're going to comp the property. You have to know what your number is going in. Have to know it. You have to know what your number is. So when you look at this right here in negotiation, when you come in, you want to go your no, go, know your negotiation number prior to going in and know what you can sell it for prior to going in and write that down in your little pamphlet, in your little book. But then what happens is when you're sitting with a seller, right, the seller is either A, they're going to sign right there on the spot, or B, they're going to give you an excuse. I got to talk to my wife. I got to talk to my real estate agent. I got to think about it. Um, you know, I'm going to talk to a couple more investors and see what I can get. Maybe I can list the property. They're going to give you a bunch of excuses. Now, what I mean by being tenacious is, is overcoming those objections and getting the seller to sign, period. Okay? Being tenacious. Overcoming those, those, those objections. And how do you overcome an objection? You get to the root of the problem.
So if someone says, hey, you know, I just want to think about it. Okay, great. What do you, what's your think about? I'm here right now. We're standing here. I came all the way out here. I like the house. You want to, I want to buy it. You want to sell it. You know, is, and you said you want to think about it. Do you want to think about, is it my price you want to think about? Is it me you want to think about? I'm here. I can answer questions for you. You know what? Here's the deal, Mr. Seller. I've got several other appointments this week I'm going on. I've got a limited amount of cash of, of, uh, of property we can actually secure on properties. So what's, you know, what's the deal? I said either either we can make a deal now or I can leave here and I can go contract another house and our deal's off, right? So we're here, so let me help you answer some questions. What do you want to think about? And what I'm doing is I'm being tenacious. I'm not letting him off the hook. Like I said, there's two ways to go. Someone walks in, he goes, well, you know, you know I just want to think about it. Okay, well, you think about it and I'll follow up and I'll call you back. That deal's dead because I'm going to walk in the next day and I'm going to get the contract signed. <laughs> Right? I tell Stan, I said, don't come back without the contract signed or just don't come back. Right? So he knows that I'm going to drill him as soon as he gets in the door and he's going to do whatever he takes to get the contract signed no matter what. So the bottom line is be tenacious. Overcome those objections. Okay? And the best way to overcome an objection is just confront the issue. I had a guy that said he wanted to talk to a realtor. I'm going to talk to a realtor. I said, what for? Listen, I've got the comps right here. What, what are they going to do? They're going to tell you that, oh, they're obviously a higher price so you can list it so you can sit on the market. Look at this place. You don't want to be here. You want to be in San Diego. You, want, you don't want to sit here and deal with this stuff and have to fix up this property, do you? No. I said, great. Well, I'm sitting right here. We can get the deal done. Here's the comps. Where do we need to be to get it done today? And if you build a level of rapport with a seller, well, guess what's going to happen? All right. You confront the situation. You know, when I go in to negotiate, I'm not leaving. My attitude is I'm not leaving until I get the contract. I don't care if I have to camp out. I don't care if I have to sleep there. I don't care if I have to live in my car out front. I'm not leaving, Mr. Seller, until I get the contract. So what's it going to take to get the deal done today? And that is an attitude of being absolutely tenacious. Here's the deal. If I am going to get in my car, you know what temperature it is out right now in Phoenix? My, my, I have these windows that overlook like this, you know, this area here. And uh, in my office, and it, the windows are hot. I mean, they're they're like cooking, hot. It's 110 degrees out. I don't like 110 degrees. So if I'm gonna get in the car in 110 degree heat, I can't even touch the steering, steering wheel because my fingers are burning. My legs are burning off the seat because my shorts I'm wearing. And I'm gonna drive down to someone's house. I'm getting the contract. There is not one excuse a guy can tell me that's going to say, okay, you're right. I'm going to walk out the door without the contract. I'm not going to sweat and get out of the car and ride, drive down there unless I'm leaving with a contract. That's just me. Now, it's just it's an attitude thing, so I hope that helps. Now, here is the biggest, biggest absolute critical thing and this is what everybody wants to avoid right because people like to blame everything but themselves successful people look inward first unsuccessful people look outward right so if you want to be successful you examine yourself this business and any type of success or running a business or, or making money or success, it's personal growth. It's you growing as a person. People get into a business in real estate or maybe you know they get into the Flip to Freedom Academy. They watch some videos. They try something. They go, oh, this doesn't work. Okay. That is the stupidest statement I've ever heard in my life. That's like me grabbing golf clubs, going to the golf course, hitting balls, and just because I don't shoot an 80, golf doesn't work. There are people making millions of dollars playing golf using the same golf clubs and using the same golf balls. So is it that golf doesn't work or is it maybe that I don't work? So a successful person is going to look inward and go, you know what? For me to get better, I have to change my behavior. 
I've got to change my thoughts. I've got to change what I have to do to get better. Now, what we're going to talk about here are some things that you can do to become a better person, right? Because here's the deal. If someone comes to me and says, it's not working, I'm going to say, okay, great. How many leads you get? Well, I'm getting 12. And they go, well, and we start digging into it. The number one reason, I should have put this first, is 80% of the problem of why it's not working is you. It's, it's actions, it's thoughts, it's behavior, vibrations, the whole thing. So we, as individuals, and I always, constantly trying to work on myself and become a better person whether it be physically working out, whether it be mentally, I read more books than I can possibly, I don't, I don't watch TV. I don't, people are like, oh my gosh, the Heat won, you know, holy cow, game seven. I don't watch TV. I like football, you know, but I mean, I am completely immersed in becoming the best I can be. I'm sure LeBron James does that, right? How do you think he becomes the best basketball player in the world? He's, immer he's talented, of course, but he immerses himself in becoming the best he can be. So the bottom line is, is that we have to do the same. I don't listen to uh, the radio in the car. When I'm driving the car, I don't listen to radio. What do I listen to? I listen to educational stuff that's going to, I'm going to learn to become a better person, to either become a better marketer, to become a better real estate investor, to become a better person become more successful person. And I do that. I don't come home, sit down, crack open a Corona and zone out to TV until I go to sleep. I, uh -uh. I, I, I don't sit down. Because, you know, listen, we've got the greatest time in our lives right now to get rich, to make a fortune. There is no time to sleep. I can sleep when I'm dead. Now's the time to take advantage of it. Learn it, become a great person, become awesome. Learn this thing and bust it out. And yes, does it take more energy? Absolutely. But who cares? Why put out 50 or 60% energy in something you hate when you can put 100% energy in something you love? Right? So it's you. Your thoughts, your feelings, and your vibrations. Here's the deal. You cannot send out all this marketing, set up a Google AdWords campaign, put all this stuff out, and expect great things to come back to you if your thoughts and the thought and the feelings and vibration are of lack. Let me, let me specify that because I, 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 if I can tell you anything in this call, this is the absolute most important thing I could tell you, right? And I had a huge, I can tell you, I had a huge, huge struggle with this because I grew up in a family. My dad made no more than $40,000, $45,000 a year as a police officer. My mom didn't work. So I grew up in a small little tiny house, right, in a neighborhood in Vermont, and small town thinking, small town, you know, I never grew up around luxury or what luxury was. When we went on vacation, I went to my grandmother's house in Windsor, Vermont, and me and my cousins would run around and play. We had friends of ours, they'd go down to... Florida, they come back all golden tan. Me, I, I'd be pasty white still. Why? Because my family couldn't afford it. So you know what was the major catchphrase in our family? Oh, we can't afford that. We can't afford. Oh, we can't afford that. Oh, oh, wouldn't it be nice to afford that? We can't afford that. And my parents, unbeknownst to them, programmed me 
to have this issue when it came to spending money, right? So every time I would spend money, I would have a conflicting feeling on the inside of a negative feeling. And here's the deal when it comes to thoughts and feelings. When you have a thought, right, a thought creates a feeling. So I would have this thought of like, ah, which would create a negative feeling. If, if you have a negative feeling towards money or towards spending money or towards sitting down paying your bills, you have like a gut-wrenching thing in your nah, then you, it doesn't matter how much marketing you do, how many ad or how many leads you get. You are not allowing the money to flow in. You are basically built a wall, and the wall is stopping all the good in the finances. If you struggle with money, this is the number one key factor. It's the number one key factor. It's, it's a, because there's a wall that's built. I had to take that brick wall down piece by piece by piece. And I tell you, I, I remember years ago when you know I would go to Target. My wife loves going to Target. I hate Target. I can't stand Target. It drives me nuts, right? Because you can't get out of that place without spending 500 bucks. It's crazy. So years ago, my wife was like, oh, let's stop by Target. I'm like, no, let's not do it. I hate Target. You know, I don't know why she likes that stupid store. I mean, why not Nordstrom? Well, thank God it's not, 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 not Nordstrom. But anyways, so Target. So, so let's start by Target. I got to pick up a few things for the house and this, that. And I was like, oh, I just hate Target. We go to Target. She get a cart. Oh, that's a bad sign, right? She's going to get a cart. Goes into Target with a cart. Every time she picks something up and put it in the cart, man, my stomach would turn in this negative feeling, and I go, ah, I feel terrible. So then she pick up another thing, put it in another thing, put it in, I'm like, oh, my gosh, we got to get, get out of here. And you know what? At that time and point in my life, things sucked financially. I was struggling. It sucked because I had this negative thing that was going on, and it was blocking and pushing, and it took a lot to get over that. Because that negative feelings, when it comes to, you know, money or you know whatever, that is pushing you away from what you really want is financial success. It's pushing you away. So what happens is we have to be acutely aware of our feelings, of how we feel. We either feel good or we feel bad. If you feel bad, you're, it's blocking. You're building the wall taller and taller. If you feel good about it, then guess what? Now you're in a position of where you're allowing things that you want to come into your life. You're allowing it. And then it comes to vibrations because what you, what your, your, your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create vibrations. That vibration attracts light vibration. So people are saying, I don't want to be broke. I don't want to be unsuccessful. I don't want to not have any money. What happens is you can't, and it's hard to explain, is that it's anything you include right, in your vibration is attracting. So if you say, I don't want to be broke, I don't want to be broke, I don't want to be broke, you're including I don't want to be broke in your vibration. So basically what's happening is now you're attracting more being broke. So you only have to focus on only what you want. So how do you do that? You have to put yourself in the feeling place as if, as if. So let me ask you a question. If I gave you a million dollars right now, everyone on this call, if I gave you a million dollars and I put it in your account right now, it's, it's going to be wired tomorrow. You know, forget it. Let's call it, you know, forget it a million. Let's call it 50 million. And you won the lottery. And you got $50 million. It's going to be wired to your account tomorrow. How would you feel? You would feel secure. You would feel 
the worry would go away about whatever, but you know, you, you feel, and there might still be a vibrational discord and it might be down, you know, it may take you a year to get over it before you feel comfortable. But what if you knew that $50 million could never go away? Because you couldn't spend the amount of interest that it was occurring every single month. So you basically had a limited amount of money. And you couldn't spend it all if you tried. What, how would you feel then? What happens is that vibration, you have to feel like that first before the money will come. And that is the hardest thing. That was the hardest thing for me. I had to put myself in a feeling place that it's already done and completed before it actually comes. Now, I want to show you something real quick. It's how to man manifest anything you want in three simple steps. The next time you want to become aware of something that you want to create, use the following three-step process to help you become a magnet for it immediately. And I'm going to make this available in the academy so you can download it. Once, you are, once you're clear about what you want, now here's this, once you are clear about what you want, and what does clear mean? Clear means knowing specifically, exactly, to the minutest detail of exactly what you want. Once you become clear of exactly what you want, let's say for an example, you want $100,000 in the bank. Ask yourself why you want it. This will always lead you to the feeling that underlines the desire, your desire. I want $100,000 cash in the bank because I'll feel relaxed about how time relates to money and success. Another way of asking is, how will I feel once I have achieved the goal or attaining this desire? I will feel relaxed, excited, I'll be enthusiastic, I'll feel great, I'll feel... Now, is that the opposite of worry? Because worry and there's not enough and there's not enough money or I go to Target and, and she's loading stuff in the car and I'm worried about how much it's going to cost and stuff like that. If I'm in a state of worry or or um, or distress or d discord of just of just constantly just you know uh, that there's not enough, those are feelings that are pushing success away. But how would I feel if I feel relaxed? I feel excited. I feel you know enthusiastic. I'd be upbeat, right? I feel happy. Those are feelings now that attract what you want. And you will know if you're going against the grain or with the grain, depending on your feeling. Now, two, after you've identified the feeling that underlines your desire, for, the, for example, you wanting to feel more secure, healthy, or love, identify three things you can do immediately to cultivate the feeling within you. Try asking yourself, what can I do right now to feel more secure? So your goal is to cultivate that feeling. That's why you, know, um, you talk about a visualization. If you can visualize yourself as if it's already happened, it's gonna it's going to kindle those feelings, which is gonna attract um, more into your life of that. So back to why it's not working. It's not working because maybe you feel worry, maybe you feel anguish, maybe you feel you know threat, maybe you know, they feel like there's not enough. You cannot do this. You cannot go do marketing, do all this stuff, and have a, that type of feeling and expect to attract a bunch of money in your life. Whatever actions you become aware of, take them, even though on the surface they appear to have nothing to do with your ultimate goal. Generating the feeling that you have already achieved your goal will help you attract it and other experiences faster. I'm telling you, the weirdest things happen in my life. I put out what I want, I know specifically what I want, and I put myself in the feeling of what I want, and things, people, places, events, and things line up that are unexplainable, that just come about, I take action on them, and things come to fruition. It's amazing. And, and I can't explain it. And it's not that I'm anything great, I just try to apply this in my life, that's it. Right? It's doing things in a certain way that other people don't do. Do you realize the majority of our society doesn't do this? The majority of our society is worried 
they're 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 nervous. They're you know they're they're there's not enough. I can't afford that. Oh you know oh woe is me. Looking for a handout. Majority of the society is like that. But we have the ability to know specifically what we want and put ourselves in that place, and amazing things will line up. So we'll, we'll make that available in the academy. So now. How to manifest, we talked about that, your behavior. Your behavior is incredibly important because what, and we talk about behavior because when I talk about behavioral congruency, behavioral congruency is if you take the top five golfers in the entire world and you put them in a room and you ask them questions about why, how they live their life, what time do they wake up in the morning, how do they practice, what do they think about when they swing, you know, um, what do they think about on the course, what do they think about when they're walking down the course, what is their eating behavior, what is their workout schedule. If you ask all these questions to the top five successful golfers in the world, what will happen is what will rise to the top is congruent behaviors. That means behaviors that you can mimic and copy in your life to accelerate success. Okay? So you can take those behavioral congruencies. Maybe they practice for three hours a day. Maybe they eat a carb free, they don't eat carbs. Maybe they wake up at 5 30 every morning. Maybe they think about, you know, when they putt, they visualize the putt before it goes in the hole. Maybe they talk to themselves different than most other people. So if you can take those behavioral congruencies and I'll put them and apply them in your life, it's the ability to accelerate success. So now, what are behavioral congruencies of a successful real estate wholesaler? Well, I know one behavioral congruency one behavioral congruency is, is waking up early. Do you realize that if you wake up at two or three, uh, two hours before everybody else does in your family, you'll get more done, you'll be more centered, you'll be more focused, you'll be more um, able to uh, visualize the things that you want in your life, plan your day. If you do that, that's a behavioral congruency. I love waking up early before everybody else. I get so much done, right? And I get to plan my day and focused and centered of exactly where I'm going, okay? That might be behavioral congruency. Maybe behavioral congruency is we drink coffee. <laughs> I don't know because I love coffee. But the bottom line is, is, uh, is behavioral congruency, is, is, is learning those things that can um, – uh, the attributes that can get success. The other thing is this, is giving and tithing. There's two different things between giving and tithing. Um, and not many people talk about this. Is that there is the universal law, right, that um, what you give will come back to you. Okay. Now, when it comes to giving, giving could be of your time. Giving could be um, of your, you know, it could, it could be of your knowledge, your education, you know? So it's, here's the thing. Let's say, you, let's say you're starting, you've been in the academy for three or four or five months and you're helping out. And in turn, someone comes and asks you a question about, you know, success, about how it works and how the wholesaling works. Instead of having a scarcity mentality and thinking, I don't want to share my knowledge with this person because they might compete against me. That's called a scarcity mentality. Instead, you're going to have an abundant mentality and realize that there is no competition and abundance is everywhere. There is nothing limiting. There's no limited deals out there. I mean, do you realize that I put the podcast out there, I put the academy out there, and I've got, I don't know, probably 500 to 1,000 people in the academy here that, that are probably local people, you know, that are local in Phoenix. They're all using the same information to compete against me, and I never have a problem finding a deal. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. It's because there is no competition. It's abundance mentality. So now, instead of you going, I'm going to have a scarcity mentality, I'm going to give of myself, I'm going to teach them what I know and help them so they can turn around and in turn become successful. 
And guess what happens? Things will start lining up in your life. That's giving of yourself, giving of your time. Right? Maybe, maybe an elderly person needs help across the street with groceries or something, so you help them out. Maybe they need help, maybe they whatever. Maybe they need help something with, you know, around the house. Maybe you can go the extra mile to try to help them out. That's giving of your time and of yourself. If you put yourself in a giving standpoint, then you're going to give, 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 as much value as you possibly can to people. Anyone you touch, try to give value to the best you possibly can then things will start lining up in your life. It's an abundance mentality. Instead of being selfish, 99% of our society is selfish. All they care is about them. What's happening to them, Who's what's up to deal with them, how it affects them, selfish, selfish, selfish. And people go, I don't understand why it's not working. Well, <laughs> again, introspect, look inside ourselves. Are they a selfish person? Do they just care about themselves? Or do they truly want to turn around and help other people? The other thing is tithing. Tithing is a biblical principle um, that is, if you don't have it in your business you're, you're, or in your life, right, you'll, you'll struggle. Not your business, your life. Um, if you have it in your life, you know, things will change. And tithing is where you give 10% of every dime that comes in your household, gross, to uh, either whatever institution that inspires you. It could be your church. Like, you know, I give to our church, right? I mean, the pastor is phenomenal, and he inspires me to be a better person. Every time I go, I just feel uplifted, and I'm like, wow. And I give 10% of every dime that comes in my household to the church. And I do it religiously. I do it um, consistently, and I do it with discipline. That is something I will absolutely not waver from. That, my friends, is a behavioral congruency because tithing is that important. If you're not tithing, it's funny, I had um, I had a guy that buys a lot of properties from me here, and what he does is he he's an investor who um, who then had uh, I mean he's like a, he's like a, a middleman guy. He goes out and finds people with money. He goes out, purchases properties. Um, he gets a little spread on the front end of it, and then he turns around and does a renovation with the other with the investor's money, and then turns around and sells the property and makes a profit. Okay, that that's what he does. So what happens is um, you know he's he's good. I, I sold him a lot of properties. He made a bunch of money. He did good. Um, but then inventory started tightening big time in Phoenix, and he had a hard time finding deals, you know, and then or finding buyers that wanted to bite off on the deals, and he started doing, struggling. So he called me up the other day, and said, "Hey man, I you know I really respect what you do, you know I really you know like work with you, um, this that and the other." And he said, "Listen, I'm struggling, you know what do you think?" You know, and I first thing, and and you know, I, I really didn't have a conversation like this with him before. It's mainly just it was just a buyer, just a guy buying buying houses, and we've met at a couple deals houses before. And I I just put it out there. I said, "Listen, man," I said, "Are you tithing?" And he said, uh, "What do you mean? What's what do you mean tithing?" I said, "Are you tithing? Are you tithing? Tithing? You're giving to you know giving ten percent." He's like, "No, what are you talking about?" So I told him the process and basically what I'm telling you here today, and uh, he called me back yesterday and left me a voicemail, and, and he was just, the guy was practically in tears. He said, oh, my gosh, you know, and I, I told him to read the book, The Four Spiritual Laws of Success. He read that book, and he goes, oh, my gosh, that book changed my life. It's ab you know, absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. And un unbelievable. Now, that book may have changed his life. I, now, I could have been... Well, you know, sucks to be you. <laughs> I could have said that. That's not the right thing to do. So I was like, hey, listen, this is, you know. So I, I, I spent 35 minutes on the phone with him and said, here, here's my two cents on it. And he took it to heart, and now he read a book, and maybe it will change his life. Maybe a year from now he'll be a completely different person because that 30 minutes, 35 minutes I spent on the phone with him, you know, to, uh, to give him advice that works. So that is you and your thoughts and your behaviors. All right?